Hello, we're live. We're here with Mary Ruddick. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. We're in Tulum. Uh, we've been in Mexico City recently. We've been traveling around, doing working digital nomad life, uh, which Mary is very good at. I'm learning how to do. And we've been investigating some diet and culture along the way. And maybe Mary can recap Mexico City a little bit. Sure, it's been fascinating. You know, I had assumed coming into Mexico this route, I haven't been in many, many years, that I would see a lot of the modern corn processing methods that we see in America. And I've been surprisingly shocked to see so many traditional methods for corn preparation. That's not despite the fact that we haven't seen a lot of modern food <laughs> and, uh, and uh, even things like ramen noodles, uh, like you posted, mm -hmm. Brian. But I have been impressed. I even saw Nixmalaya's corn tortillas in the 7-Eleven, which was pretty impressive. And most of the women at the street food stands have been using the five-step process as well. There have been many stands that cook with the pork lard and using lots of the tallow and the animal fat while cooking the meat and so for the first time I broke one of my rules that I've had with all of these travels mm -hmm. <laughs> I never eat street food mm -hmm. it's <laughs> working yeah. with so many people I see how people get sick overseas and it's often swimming in fresh water uh, and street food and so I've, I've avoided street food thus far but I have to say we found so many stands that were cooking in animal fat and where the grandmas were making the proper tortillas that I even ate some of the tortillas. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got, I've gone back to the meat, but it was nice while it lasted. It was fun and, uh, and it was a good surprise, yeah. I would say. Yeah, it was great. Like We've kind of gone back and forth. Sometimes we just get platters of just all meat. Mm -hmm. So if you tell them, people don't know this, they'll do it. Right? They'll just give you a whole plate and just, you say five tacos, just seen tortillas, and then they'll just put it on the plate and just give you all the different meats and salsa and anything else you want to put on it. It was really great. But yeah, it's great to have the tortilla as well. You know, try one of them, uh, especially if they're mixed normalized. Maybe you could talk about what mixed normalization even is. Sure. So corn, as we know, is a historical crop, but it's a crop that's become problematic in modern years. Traditionally in Latin America, especially in the northern regions where corn was consumed, again, so corn was kind of in these northern regions where we are here, and then as you go south towards Peru, then the starches become things like yucca, plantain, uh, and even potato as well. But traditionally, corn didn't cause the health issues that it's causing these days because it went through a five-step process. Hi, Bill. Hey, Welcome. how are you guys? Hey. <laughs> Good. Go ahead. I don't want to interrupt the nystomalization. Go ahead. Oh, I feel like you're the best person to say it. I'll do a summary, and then you can you can uh, add on to it. But the five-step process for corn would basically neutralize the plant toxins and prevent deficiencies from occurring when you eat it. So there was sprouting, soaking, fermentation, and then of course treating with lye. So all of these methods were really needed before you could consume corn without having a health issue. And so I was, I was just telling Brian though that I've been pleasantly surprised at how much of the traditional corn methods I've found here throughout Mexico in the last six weeks. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that, and that process, we know that process is at least 4,000 years old, but uh, maize itself was domesticated at least 10,000 years, years ago. And we just, uh, about a year and a half ago, figured out a way to archaeologically uh, look at a site, look at the remains, and tell if the maize there has been nystomalized or not. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm convinced that date's going to get pushed back by thousands and thousands of years. There, there's no, there's no, no doubt in my mind. And you spent time in Mexico as well, and Peru, and in some other places? Yeah, and, and that's, that's the reason I came to Mexico. Well, to learn two things, some traditional cheese making to make quesillo, um, but also the main reason was to learn about nishtamalization. And we spent time in Mexico City. Um, we were with um, uh, Galia, who I think may even be on here. Galia is, is amazing, and she's the, the Western uh, price uh, leader for uh, at least Mexico City, if not all of Mexico. Um, and she brought me to, you guys were in Mexico City a few days ago, right? Did you get to Cali Maiz with Rahel Sotelo? He's awesome. He's doing a bunch of work with uh, and, uh, heirloom varieties of maize and, and nishtamalization. But we went and stayed with a family in Oaxaca on an area called San Antonio de la Cal. It's a little village on top of a mountain. But the cool part about this village 
is that the entire mountain is made up of cow or calcium hydroxide. So when you're nishtamalizing with cow, they can just literally pull it right out of the ground and stick it in the pot. Incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. And where are you? You should tell us where you are. Yeah, so I have, first, well, I'm, in, I'm in the northwest coast of Ireland in this gorgeous little fishing village called Belderig. And I'm in front of a peat fire in a good friend of mine's, uh, mine's um, uh, cabin, not cabin, what, what is the word we're looking for here? Cottage. cottage, cottage. And I got to show you who we have here. So this is my good friend, Jason O'Brien, who's a uh, fantastic, he's, he's an archaeologist. He went to school for archaeology, but he owns a food company, a fantastic, several food companies in Ireland. And he uses, you know, he has the same sort of um, approach to food that we do because of his archaeological background. And he uses that to inform his decisions on how he's going to supply incredibly high quality food all over Ireland. And my good friend, Dr. Aidan O'Sullivan, who is an archaeologist at University College Dublin and runs uh, one of the only uh, experimental archaeology graduate programs in the world. And so he's training archaeologists to actually uh, use hands-on approaches to, to technology, stone tool production, house building, uh, cooking in ancestral ways to inform the way they interpret the archaeological record. So we're here and I got to show you outside real quick. I hope I don't lose a signal. There's no signal here as you can imagine. But this is the view. Oh, wow. And it's the first northwest coast and the mountains you see in the distance are actually the Appalachian Mountains. So when the continents broke away, part of the Appalachian Mountains ripped away. Um, I have no idea. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. So it's, it's raining outside, as you can imagine. It's lashing rain. Um, and then hold on. I'll try not to lose you. And right over this hill here. Down... Uh oh. We're losing you. And you got to go back. <laughs> go back. Go back, Bill. <laughs> You're breaking up. I think we have to be in the. It was worth a try. Success. So we're, we're only a few miles away from the world's oldest complex field system. And, oh, I have, there, they have no, there's no signal. Shit. <laughs> no, you're back now. Now you're back. I might have to read. Well, really, actually. I, don't know I think you sit by the fire still. Okay. I'm at. I'm at the fire. Hopefully. I'm at the fire. Can you hear me? Well. Yeah, kind of. Maybe we, we can just take over for a second. Mm -hmm. Take it on for a minute, and I'll see if I can get a better uh, signal. I might boot out and try to boot back right. in. Is that? Okay? Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> so we'll go back to the nixtamalization. So the interesting thing for me was that the closer or the farther away from the city I got or to the more uh, worker areas of the city, I was seeing the traditional methods. And that's even here in Tulum, which is basically a resort town <laughs> for yogis. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in the main strip, I highly doubt it's gone through the process. I mean, potentially it has. But when you go out to the regions like we took you yesterday for mm -hmm. those for those tacos, those are properly made tortillas. So these are things I, I don't know about you. I still wouldn't use unless I was in good health, like perfect health. But someone in health could maintain their health on that food, uh, which fits with history. Well, I think it's interesting is some people ask the questions like, how did these cultures survive for all these years on corn like there's a lot of corn and and i've always wondered that too because it's not very nutrient dense and we know about the different anti-nutrients in it and this is why they use this five-step process so they could give i don't know if they're thriving if that's the base of their diet but they have got some bond yeah and it's typically not the basis of the diet you know it's a vehicle for for fat for meat or seafood for ferments, things like that. So we see we see a lot. I mean, these are very fatty meals that we have been eating, and these are in the more traditional places. If you go towards the more modern places, you see uh, more American-style Portland tacos and things like that. Okay, Dr. Bill, now that you're back on, 
and you have two archaeologists with you. I have to ask you a question, and, and okay. I apologize if this isn't their field or your field, so please don't feel that you have to answer. But, okay. <laughs> I, was, I was teaching a class earlier this month on plant toxins, and I, I was teaching to hundreds of practitioners on oxalates and lectins, and we got around to solanines, and solanines and tomatines are ones that I've always found to be more insidious because they're fat soluble and they're very difficult to get rid of. But that really doesn't go with the history of food consumption because those are found in potatoes and potatoes were a staple crop in parts of the world. And I understand that you saw some interesting processing of potatoes and I'm wondering if that doesn't neutralize those plant toxins. So would you or your buddies be able to give us some insights on the potential degradation of solanine, tomatine, and these more insidious uh, fat soluble plant toxins found within the tomato. And I say more and insidious. Potato. Yeah. Tomato and potato. Tomato and potato. Yeah, because yeah, the tomatine, because they stay in the body for longer. They're there for 30 to 90 days as opposed to the lectin. Corn, which is in and out quickly. Uh, so yeah, so I've never let my patients go back to eating potatoes afterwards. And I, I know that doesn't fit with history. So I've had this conflict. Could you help me? Well, I, yeah, well, you know, we were actually literally, we were sitting in Ireland and potatoes obviously yeah. in here as well. So we were having this, just this conversation this morning uh, over some, um, some uh, blood, you know, blood, uh, blood sausage. So anyhow, we, um, yeah, I went down to, just for the very reasons you're talking about, I went down to Peru and Bolivia and lived with an Aymara family, uh, native family in the Altiplano of Bolivia, and then a Quechua family in the Andes of, of Peru. And what I wanted to see was how they detox, use technology to detoxify the potatoes and make them safe for consumption. Now, it's important to understand that they were eating potatoes that were highly, highly toxic. Um, and all native potatoes are highly toxic, like at a level that will kill you and make you sick fairly quickly. Um, and most of the heirloom varieties, old heirloom varieties, were incredibly toxic as well. What's been done over thousands of years, and they think the potato was domesticated around 10,000 years ago, right in the region that I was at, is that the, the breeding didn't get rid of those toxins. It just brought them to a lower level. And what's really scary about that is when we bring the toxins down to a lower level where they don't have an immediate effect on someone or at least a, a recognizable effect on somebody right away, we forget about them and it's not in our conscience. So nobody that most of the people I talk to don't realize that there's an inherent danger with eating even a store-bought potato when there really is. So the reason I went down was because I know that those potatoes they're dealing with have the same toxins just at much higher levels. It's in their conscience. It's in their daily practice of how they deal with the potatoes. And this is what I learned. Number one, they eat a massive quantity of potatoes. And I mean, sometimes eight, mm -hmm. 10, 12 potatoes a day per person. <clears throat> um, and in every single case, except for one, which I'll tell you about in a minute, they always peel them, period, across the board. And, the, and it turns out that the highest concentrations of toxins are in the skin of the potato, which makes complete sense because those toxins are there for a reason. It is um, energy expensive for those plants to create those toxins. So there's a reason they're there. And the reason they're there is to protect their natural insecticides and fungicides and herbicides. They protect the valuable parts of plants from predation from other, from other things. So it makes sense that the skin, the barrier between the, you know, this energy uh, powerhouse, the, the, the underground storage organ of the potato plant and anything that could attack it is there. So the first thing they always did was peel it. Didn't matter if they boiled it or fermented it or, um, stuck it in the oven, they always peeled it. And what's, in, what's fascinating is that their potatoes, their heirloom potatoes are not like ours where it looks like a football and with a potato peeler, you can peel it in 15 seconds. These potatoes were these gnarly looking things and they had knives and it took them, you know, five minutes to peel one potato. So it, they did it purposefully and it made sense. The other thing is that they rarely, especially these heirloom varieties, rarely did they just eat them. They always did something to uh, detoxify them at some level. So the main reason I went down was to see them practicing the act of geophagy, which is the intentional consumption of earth, which we see across animal species and in a lot of humans still today. But we think obviously we were eating massive amount, not massive, we, were, we included um, dirt or earth or clays in our diets for a long period of time. We do it for two reasons. One, to increase uh, mineral consumption. 
and two, to detoxify our food. And there's a lot of toxins with the right kind of clays in the soil that will bind with the toxin. It puts it into a state our body can't recognize. So we absorb the nutrition from the food and then we pass the toxins through, or some of the toxins at least through our body. So in uh, the Aymara group I was with, they still practice this and they take in, in, incredibly toxic potatoes. They uh, roast them in these little um, ornitos, these little ovens that they build out of, out of dirt. And if there's no trees on the Alto Plano, it's too high. And they use uh, cow patties, cow manure to fuel these fires. They roast these potatoes. And then they, when they eat them, they take the potatoes, they dip them in the clay and every bite goes to the clay, into their mouth, into the clay, into their mouth. And uh, a couple of big takeaways were number one, these were the most toxic potatoes I ate the entire time I was there. And they ate the, the, the clay did it. They didn't peel these potatoes. It was the only time they didn't peel the potatoes, which I think speaks to the power of the clay detoxification. And number two, which I thought was fascinating, um, it tasted good. Like mm. it wasn't this weird, like, oh my gosh, I'm eating dirt or this is a weird texture or weird flavor. The youngest daughter in the family, um, when we were done, uh, eating all the potatoes, there was still some clay um, in the bottom of the bowl. And she took her finger like a kid today would do with mayonnaise or ketchup. And she just took it and just started eating all the, all the clay. She enjoyed the flavor. Then the other group, and uh, real quick, in the, in the Andes, they make something called tokash, which is a long fermented potato. They take the potatoes and they bury them in the ground for a minimum of six months. Um, the stuff I had, we I took out of the ground, was in the ground for two years pulled it out of the ground, peeled it, and ate it raw, and also cooked them, and they, they their main traditional dish, I forget the name of it, they would, this was the basis of it. Um, not only do those practices detoxify the potatoes, and uh, in the case of the, the fermentation, pre-digest the potatoes to allow the bodies to have more access to the nutrition, but uh, they're looking in Peru right now at that's a, um, the medicinal value of these potatoes are out of control. They are um, they, they're seeing all, all, all sorts of cancer uh, fighting benefits from it. And as you can imagine, with all fermented foods, there's a ton of different benefits. Uh, so what we did, uh, what we're doing at the Modern Stone Age Kitchen back in um, back in Maryland is we're taking these some of these ideas and applying it to modern food. So we're taking potatoes and we are fermenting the potatoes and then frying them, we're peeling them, fermenting them. And then we're frying them in high quality animal fat like lard and making uh, chips and, 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 and fries that are something that are a much healthier alternative to the, most of the chips and the fries that our, our kids have access to. And did you find that they were also cooking them in large amounts of fats? They actually, the, the fat that they used was all animal fat. Um, mm -hmm. And what's, uh, it, it is much too long of a conversation to have right now, but I'd love to talk to you about it later on. It turns out that they have a myth, um, it's called, um, Believe it or not, it's, it sounds like fish taco, but it's not fish taco. It's spelled with a P and all this. But it's fi uh, fish taco, which is a um, – uh, it's worth looking into, at least Googling it real quick. They have an incredibly interesting relationship with fat. And this um, this character in this in this myth is a, uh, a demon that uh, if somebody is seen as taking fat – it's called he's called the fat sucker. It's taking uh, – it's doing something and taking from you – this demon comes and, and over time sucks the fat out of your body and you end up and you end up dying. But um, it's a much longer conversation. But the, the whole point of it is they they're they're one major sort of figure in this mythology you know, outlook on life has to do with fat and the importance of fat and the importance of, in this case, animal fat. OK, because I was wondering, I would think that the solanine, if not broken down by all these methods, would, because it is fat soluble, if it was cooked in a lot of fat, could bind to that fat instead of the bodily yeah, fat. Around fat. Yeah, and come through just like it would with the clay, potentially. Yeah, and there's, there's two quick things I'll mention with this, and I, and I can't speak directly to the solanine and the, is it tom, tom, how you say, tomatine? Oh, tomatine, and that's in tom tomato. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I can't speak directly to that, and, and not enough work has been done here. Um, the thing that I find fascinating is that here, again, is just another example of a human-created technology to make a food safer and more bioavailable to our incredibly inefficient digestive tracts, and I, I hope a lot of work goes into looking at the power of that. Um, but two things that I think are, are very important. One is that I ha still haven't found a – and if anybody ever finds any, please let me know – a good way to um, mitigate the negative impact of oxalates 
fermentation. I've seen a few peer reviewed, peer reviewed studies recently that are showing that it does help a little bit, but oxalates continue to be a huge issue we need to look out for, even in this case. Um, and number two, and this is a quick side note, but for anybody who wants to maybe do some of these things at home, like the fermenting the potatoes um, and with the fat, one of the issues with potatoes today, in addition to everything we said, it's a, it's a human modern created uh, way that we cook the fat that does this. But when you cook a starch in a high temperature, it creates acrylamides. And we know mm -hmm. acrylamides, and so it's the combination of starches hitting hot, hot anything, but in this case, fat produces acrylamides. They're cancer. They, they have a huge issue with. You know, if you go to California and look at a bag of uh, potato chips, it'll say on the back, "Danger! This um, contains acrylamides." We know that there's a link between acrylamides and cancer, and it's not that that was in the potato. That was a result of the starch and the way that we cooked it in a high temperature to produce these acrylamides. The cool thing about fermenting potatoes is the food for the lactobacillus bacteria is the starch. So by fermenting potato, automatically you're reducing the amount of starch. And then when you cook it in fat, you're not producing the same number or the same amount of acrylamides. And it, that is just another way that this becomes a safer dish as well. And I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. anybody all of a sudden make potatoes the mainstay of their diet. But if you're going to eat potatoes, there's a healthier, safer way to do it. No, that's interesting because I, uh, I've been fascinated in polysaccharides and their use in immune regulation and blocking of lectins and these kind of things for well over two decades now. And there is one in potatoes. And my conflict was like <laughs> what I mentioned earlier. I was like, well, yes, this is here, but then how do you get to this benefit with, with the negatives? How do you neutralize the negatives of the potato? And clearly traditional cultures were able to do that. So yeah, I totally agree. I'm not running out to go eat potatoes, but I think if you go through these processes, there's nothing wrong with it. If you're healthy, obviously, because historically, they were eaten. Okay, I have to ask you another question. Okay. Do you know much about the traditional Aztec diet? Not enough to speak uh, speak well about at all. But let I, me ask me what you're going to ask, and I'll see if I do know. About okay, it. I have been digging and digging because what what I find on the surface doesn't seem to fit with any historical culture. And one thing I never see mentioned is what cooking fat they're using, and I think that was a big. A missing link in the blue zone study specifically in Costa Rica. It wasn't mentioned what kind of fat they were using and had that been in there, people would have had a very different take of the diet, right? So mm -hmm. I know in at least what I could find out from the museums, the archaeological museum and some of, there's a wonderful historical medicinal plant center in Mexico City that's right by the hospital in, uh, in Roma Norte, but all I could find out was that they did eat ducks, and perhaps, in my mind, maybe they're using duck fat as their cooking fat. I couldn't see what else they would have as a cooking fat. Do you have any? Well, they wouldn't have had, had access to any nut or seed oils or, in, you know, or, or even vegetable oils. It, they, 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 it wasn't even a possibility, so by, by default, it, it had to be animal fat. And yes, the, the duck hunting was, was, was fairly um fairly common and, and what's if you i'm sure you guys have seen that this is crazy it's sort of a link back this is how important duck hunting was the word at lateral which is the you know the spear with the with the handle mm -hmm. it's about two feet long that we see around uh, all over the world about forty thousand years ago the term at lateral is a new waddle word it's an aztec word and it actually means spear over water and they were using that to actually hunt waterfowl hunt ducks with and other things as well but the importance that that's the name that actually stuck so I, you know, sometimes we have to come around on the back end to sort of at least suggest some of the answers to these questions. But there was no access to the kind of industrial nut and seed oils we see today. Number one, the only access to fat they would have had is is animal fat for sure. Right, because I see so much influence on that they were a plant based culture. And if you talk to any of the tour guides, that's what they're going to say. But when I when I look at it, you see that they were fishing, they were hunting, they were eating insects, and the cooking fat I think really points to if it's truly plant based or mixed, and and if they did have say duck fat or using the the hunting animals, then it would be more of a mixed diet instead. Absolutely, and you remember the the, uh, the way that we interpret archaeology, the, the only. It, it, it's a very scientific process to approach how we excavate sites, how we record sites. But from that point forward, everything is open to interpretation. And even though we always try to interpret without bias, 
it always seeps in. So, and you can see this, especially throughout the history of archaeology over the past hundred years. Things that are happening around the world and in, in modern life are certainly impacting the way that we we interpret what we find on an archaeological site. And I can't imagine a world in which the plant forward sort of uh, mantra that's happening today isn't influencing at some level how we interpret this, especially where you're looking at a docent at an archaeological you know, site walking a tour group through and trying to connect with that tour group talking to people. So I, that doesn't mean, and I don't know anything else about who did it, so I can't, who was actually saying these things. But I'll also say one other thing about fat uh, in these areas that have warmer climates. You know, one thing that's typically said, okay, yeah, I understand if you're, if you're further away from the equator and you're by the poles, those animals, these wild animals carry a lot more fat and it was easier for somebody like an Inuit, for example, to have access to fat. But when you get closer to the, um, you know, when you get closer to the equator, a lot of the wild animals aren't carrying as much fat, especially all year round. So maybe they didn't have as much access to fat. Well, that comes from a perception of the only access to fat is that fat that you see on, you know, on top of the meat, you know, that's covering a piece of meat. You know, there's a lot of places that animals carry fat. For example, marrow, which is one of the most nutritious, right? in and around the organs for sure, and actually in the bones, the bone grease itself. And we know that animals will actually die of starvation before they impact their marrow resources whatsoever. So even a starving animal in the tropics would have um, you know, t bones full of marrow and bones full of bone grease, which is easy to extract if you're making something like a, a bone broth out of the bones. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. We had a lot of bone marrow two nights we ago. We have eaten so much bone marrow. <laughs> yeah, and it was fun yeah. talking to people who we're with who aren't educated on nutrition, and they really are bought into this plant-based, plant-forward paradigm. They just don't get it. They, they didn't know why bone marrow is healthy at all. But I was explaining to them the history of humans and how this is part of the reason we became human, is we had access. This is all stuff that Bill taught me, and we had the tools, and we break open the bones and eat the marrow, and there's such valuable nutrients and energy that created humans. And now everyone here thinks vegan is the way to go, especially in Tulum. It's all like, oh, vegan menu, <laughs> vegan menu. And it's just crazy because Bill's out here doing the real work, like, you know, out there looking at these ancient cultures and how they live. And you, you of course, have not found any vegan cultures. This is all like animal-based nutrition has been around forever. Yeah. And you know what? Two things. I heard you guys talking about the street food and how amazing some of the street food in Mexico is. And I mean, I was when I was with Galley a few weeks ago, we we're in Mexico City and we're eating tacos made with beef eyes. I mean, yes. the entirety of what goes in the middle are, are cow eyes. It was And it was a fantastic taco. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the, the people who are making the really good high quality food are uh, living at a, at, a, at a poverty level and it makes sense to them economically to, you know, they're making this amazing food, they're selling it all and they're feeding their family boxes of pasta and, you know, big two liters of Coca-Cola. And so I just bring that up because there's another side to some of this, you know, we, we have to do something to change the entire system and empower the people that are making the good food to also feed themselves and their families cool. the same. Well, I posted about this. Well, two things. One is they go through the five-step process of nixtamalization, and then they just douse it in vegetable oil. It's oh, just a sad some part. Of them, yeah. Some of them, yeah. Some of them. Half of the, we found the ones that cooked with the lard, but it's so sad to see they just don't understand it, or maybe they've gotten the mainstream message of you know eat the vegetable oil, or it's just cheaper. Whatever it is, it's sad. Another really sad thing I posted about is. In Mexico City, I watched two women. I said they ate a meal completely free of protein and nutrients. They ate the, the instant noodles, you know, those cup of noodles mm -hmm. with chips, cookies, and two liter soda. That was their whole meal. That was the whole They're, meal. The whole meal. The whole meal. We I, was, were... I, was, I, was, I couldn't stop talking about it. Mary's like, why, why is this guy still talking about this? I'm like, I, I see it all the time, which I should be taking photos of this. You're right to do so. But we were at a Pilke restaurant. Well, a pilke cafe with the real pilke, where it's been fermented for two weeks as opposed to the one day and it's got the strength. For, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's a, a fermented beverage from Aztec times made from the, the inulin, the agave plants, and it's fermented into an alcohol, but it's very nutritious and very filling. It feels like you've eaten a soup. It's, uh, you feel well it's taken amazing. care of.
But anyway, we were there and it was a local place. It wasn't a tourist place, so it was lots of locals. And behind us, mm -hmm. <laughs> there were these two girls that were eating that meal. And for those, I know you've gotten some flack about the pricing of that. It's actually much cheaper to get the street tacos and to not have a meal like that with the instant noodles and the soda. So it wasn't an issue of, of poverty or of saving money. I think it's an issue of misinformation, of, of lost knowledge of how important this food is and how nutritious it is and how it actually is better for you than, uh, than empty calories. Yeah, and it definitely is there and available. So uh, yes. two weeks ago when we tried to, to, um, to meet up in Mexico, you know, I was in Oaxaca, and I wish yes, we could have. We just um, missed each other. But I was teaching at this, um, and anybody who's listening that likes anything about fermentation, you have to check this event out. It happens every year. Gallia um, is one of the, the organizers of it. It's called Ferment Oaxaca. And they bring amazing people in. We, they bring people from all over the world in. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes, yeah. great. Okay, they bring they bring people in that are uh, you know experts in different types of fermentation, and you spend several days in these in these wonderful classes face to face with these people. We had they had people in from England and from Denmark that work at with Noma. Um, they had people from North. They had all kinds of people in, and I was teaching a class on fermenting offal. So uh, we, when I got in there, they you know the markets in Oaxaca, like all over Mexico, have awesome access to to offal. And we didn't think getting anything was going to be a problem, the ingredients that I needed. But the problem that I had was actually getting back fat, that fat on the back of a pig that exists between the, the loins and the skin. And usually on most pigs, it's at least an inch thick. On some pigs, it's inches thick. And we went into the market to get it. We couldn't get any. So we finally found somebody that said they would bring it to us the next day. And the workshop was literally the next day. So we were a little bit nervous. And I said, listen, just grab the skin with all the fat on it. And that's what I want. And we got it back and there was hardly any skin or any fat on it whatsoever. And the reason is because they're taking that, all that fat, rendering it down and they're cooking all the chicharrones in it. And so it's important to them and they won't give it up. So it's not like this fat isn't at some level a part of their, uh, a part of uh, Mexican culture in different places. And it's not like it's not available, but it's that misinformation that these um, industrial nut and seed oils are gonna save the planet and that that stuff's gonna kill us. So bogus. And I want to go back to the potatoes because I shared a meal with your family. It was really great. We're filming for Food Lies, and uh, you made us some lacto-fermented fries. Yep. And so yep. we were talking, you talked about the traditional method in Peru, and they bury it. And you can also watch some of Bill's, Bill's videos on YouTube. I guess it's the modern Stone Age. Do you have those up? Yep, we sure do. Okay, so it's really cool to see him digging up the potatoes. It was they buried them in a river. And yeah, I've seen a lot of your, your videos of doing these different things around the world with these ancient cultures. It's so cool to, that you're actually, well, that's what Mary's doing. That's what I'm trying to do as well. Yeah. Go around, see how they're really doing this. We're going to get a TV show someday. We'll have to talk about this after. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you can do it at home. You can do it at home yeah. and you don't have to bury it in a river for six months. You can use a little salt and uh, I'll let Bill explain. Yeah, and, that, and that's really, Brian, that's so, I, I love the work that you guys are doing and I, I follow you guys and I'm so glad you're getting the message out. Um, the, the discussion around these things are always inspiring. It's always informative. It's always exciting, but that's the real, I mean, that's the real thing we have to do is, is turn it into something tangible, some real lessons. And uh, one of the cool things about this potato uh, approach is that it's something very easy to do. You only need potatoes, water, salt, and a mason jar. That's it. So um, most of my vegetable ferments, uh, the magic number is always two, two percent. So two percent of whatever the vegetable is, the, the contents of the jar. So if it's cucumbers and water to make pickles, the combined weight of cucumbers and water, everything inside of that jar, I, I find two percent of that and add that much salt in. So multiply it by 0 0.02, add the salt in, put a lid on it and set it aside. If it's cabbage to make sauerkraut, chop up all the, all the cabbage, put it in the jar, weigh the in contents, multiply it by 0 0.02, add that much salt and you're good to go. And it's the same thing here. So if you take the potatoes, peel them, and I, and I so this is the steps I, I would always take. Um, take the, I'd have a bowl of, of water, and I peel the potatoes and put the potatoes in the bowl of water because they'll start to oxidize if they're sitting out. And depending on how much you're making, they may be out for a little while. So put them right into, a, right into water. Um, once they're, I have enough, I'll then cut them to the finished size. So I'll either cut them into French fries or slice them into potato chips. I put them in a mason jar, add water, 
and I always leave a gap of about three quarters of an inch between the top of the water and the top of the jar because things will expand. You don't want it running over. Uh, make sure I weigh the contents of the jar. So that's the combined weight of the potatoes and the water. Multiply it by 0 0.02. That's how much salt I add. I add that much salt. I stir it up. And the nice thing about potatoes, in, as opposed to a lot of other vegetables, they usually don't float in the water. So you don't need to do anything to really keep them down. And make sure they stay under the top of the water. Set them in a nice, you know, warm, well, somewhat warm. A, a great fermentation temperature is 62 degrees, but room temperature is fine, 70, 75 degrees for about five days. And you'll see that there's so much food for that lactobacillus bacteria in the potatoes that they'll start to ferment in just a couple days. Let that ferment. Now, look, this, it, it will look nasty. And what you're doing is detoxifying that potato. So that clear water will start to turn brown. It'll actually start to smell a little bit. Most ferments start to smell more pleasant as they go on. But most ferments, you're eating the entirety of it, right? You can eat the pickle and drink the pickle juice, or you can eat you know, the cabbage and, uh, and the sauerkraut and also the, the, the sauerkraut juice. This is something completely different because what's coming out of that potato and what's happening is making the potato safer and making that water nasty. Throw the water out, throw the potato peels out or compost them, throw that water out. Do not you know, try to recycle it and put it in pasta or, or a mm. veggie stock. Or, don't throw it out, it's poison. Rinse those potatoes, pat them dry, and then fry them. And don't then turn around and fry in you know, peanut oil. It's terrible. Take it and fry it in lard or tallow. Um, and again, I know this might be this might be too much information, but for anybody that cares, um, if you're fr if you're frying the potato, uh, you know, French fries, best French fries are fried twice because you it, it's impossible to take, especially thicker cut fries, cook them. Um, to the right temperature on the inside and also crisp the outside at one time, it's impossible to do. So you take the French fries and fry them at 325 degrees for five minutes. That will cook the inside. Pull them out, lay them out on a tray, and then turn the temperature up on the fryer. And while they're sitting there and cooling, there's some stuff happening on the outside of those potatoes that'll help make the outside more crisp and, and more pleasurable to eat. Uh, you can either freeze them, they're cooked, Freeze them right away, and then you can pull them out and do the final cook whenever you want, or just wait till the temperature's the right temperature and, and turn it up to 375. Throw those um, uh, already cooked fries into there, and all you're doing is crisping the, crisping the outside, and then sprinkle some salt, and you're good to go. For the potato chips, you want to do something different. You want those potato chips to dehydrate and cook at the same time. So um, because a, a, a potato chip that still has moisture on the inside is soggy, you don't want that at all. So what you do is you, you fry it about 300 degrees. It's very low, but what happens is that that's enough time for the moisture to leave, um, leave the thinly cut potatoes and then uh, before it cooks, and then it'll cook and get crisp. So 300 degrees, throw the potato um, slices in there, cook them until they're crisp, usually about five minutes or so, sprinkle them with salt, and, and they're good to go. But again, I'm not suggesting you turn around and feed your family you know, French fries all the time every day but if you're going to eat french fries if your kids are going to eat them if you're going to feed your family something like that then this is the safest and most nourishing way to do it i love this i love this so bill's all about making this ancestral wisdom accessible to people and if you yeah like you said it's a treat but just know it's not that french fries are inherently toxic it's just the way we do them in our modern society and i have many episodes with bill and mary actually multiple peak human podcast episodes where we go to all, all this in detail, you talk about dairy fermenting the traditional way and how American cheese and real cheese should not even be called cheese. They are completely different items, completely different. And one is nutritious and, and delicious and it's what we've done and it, it's gotten it so that we can digest it. And one is just a modern process, just trash, really. Absolutely. So I love that. And I want to recap. I'm going to throw it to Mary for the last. We'll try to wrap it up in five minutes. But we were talking about geophagy earlier. So if you mm -hmm. want to look that up, we kind of went through really quickly, but that's when Bill was talking about them dipping the potatoes in clay. So you can look that up, geophagy. And um, yeah, Mary, what else do we have? <laughs> well, I was going to ask you so many more questions. We'll have to do it next time. I have questions about cassava and cyanide and mm. the biodynamic practice of burying organs at certain phases of the moon. But we'll get into those <laughs> another time. We have a lot uh, to talk about. Yeah, yeah, I would love to talk about it. But in the last bit, uh, I'd love to talk about oxalates a little bit, because you said you wanted to know more about those, and it's a specialty of mine, so maybe maybe I can pay you back a favor here. Uh, there's, there's several things you can do to neutralize them. One is, so first of all, 
humans should be able to break down 50 milligrams of oxalates a day. That's a should. That's in a healthy individual, and that's in someone who has the probiotics that can eat oxalates as well. Not just oxalobacter, but there's cassiri, and there's about eight other ones that potentially could. The problem with these probiotics is that if we don't get them through the mother's birth canal, we don't get them at all. And if something happened to the mother where she didn't have these, then the child is born without these. And there's not a way currently to get them through diet. And currently they're not on the market. Gasiri is, but I, I haven't in practice seen taking that as a pill to work with oxalate issues. However, there are things that neutralize oxalates. So, of course you want to do the cooking methods that reduce them. So for instance, a, a cup of spinach has on average about 700, 750 milligrams of oxalates. Now that's a lot. Uh, luckily the spinach season is short. So if people were doing spinach salads, which were not a traditional food, <laughs> the spinach would have been cooked, uh, you still would have had over 11 months to clear those oxalates from your system. So it wouldn't have been as much of a problem. Now these, these areas where spinach grows tended to eat dairy as well. When you eat dairy at the same time as an oxalate food, the oxalate will bind to the calcium in the dairy and it will go straight through your body. It won't bioaccumulate. So if someone has oxalate issues, if they're physically able to eat dairy, that's very important and it's going to be very helpful in the process, of course. For someone just starting out with oxalates, uh, we, we want to make sure that we don't overfeed these bacteria because let's say you were born with oxalobacter, you were one of the 50% that's lucky enough to, you can actually overfeed these guys. And if you overfeed these little bugs, they, they die from being overfed. <laughs> so you don't want to go and have spinach, spinach smoothies every day. Going back to the cooking method though, if we take that cup of spinach and we boil it and we discard the water, it only cuts the oxalates in half. So that's 300, 350 or so. So really that alone is not enough. So it's really important to either eat the, the oxalate foods very seasonally, always cooked, and to ideally have, uh, have dairy with it. One thing that would be very interesting to look into would be to see if some of these soils that are being consumed in South America would have the citrate form of any of the minerals. Because the citrate form, whether it's potassium citrate, calcium citrate, magnesium citrate, all of these will bind to oxalates and prevent them from attaching to bodily tissue and bioaccumulating. Mm -hmm. So that can be very helpful. Now, one last thing, and it's a huge topic, so I'll, I'll mm -hmm. make it short. But one last thing, if you're on a carnivore diet, you can use lemon juice. If you drink lemon juice, that will actually uh, allow the, the uh, release of oxalates in the tissues to come out. Can I but ask not, you a question? Because <laughs> I, 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 I would love to sit down and, and pick your brain about this for a long time. But one quick question, because we were talking about this earlier today. How about nuts? Things like almonds. Uh -huh. Is there a way to mitigate? The oxalates and nuts. In there. I think the best way to go is to go for the higher fat nuts if you're going to eat them regularly. So, for instance, macadamia and pecan are not high oxalate at all because of the fat percentage. They're very high fat and therefore there's not as many oxalates. You can, of course, I mean, I'm always, if you're going to have nuts, they should be soaked and sprouted always. Uh, that's going to slightly reduce the oxalate content. But really, nuts should be eaten seasonally. They are a traditional food. Even where I'm from in, a, in Ohio, the natives there, uh, they, they would eat acorns. They would make them into breads and things like that. But it wasn't eaten year round. It was eaten one season of the year. So I think it's important to try not to rely on foods as a daily substance other than meats and things with non-plant toxins. Right. All right, awesome. And, and I think it's important for people to remember, too, that we forget how difficult it is to process the nuts to get them out because we can buy them in huge bags already shelled and we eat them by the handful, whereas you'd never eat that many in a, in a single sitting because it would take you three days to crack them all. Yes, okay, so I was just listening to a story and I don't know if this is a myth or not, but in old Peru, apparently a good wife was someone who could peel the potatoes very quickly. And if someone couldn't peel potatoes quickly, they were not wife material, uh -huh. which I think is so relevant for your story of the tiny potatoes and how hard that would be. Or, yeah, that's so I don't forget percent. how much work it is to get to these foods. And if, if we sat down and even if we just sat down and wrote a gratitude journal about all the steps 
that that food had to go through to get to our table, we would think about the consumption rate very differently. Absolutely. Hey, can I show you real quick? I know we've got to go, but it'll take 30 seconds. Our meal for the night. This is, this is I'm going to turn this around and show the meal for the night. So oh, wow. we just went down to the coast and collected. We have four different kinds of seaweed. Wow. We have wild venison burgers. It's, it's what's cool in, in Ireland is you're actually allowed, hunters are allowed to sell wild game if they're licensed to do it. So people that don't have access to hunting because they're either not hunters or don't have the land or whatever, they can actually go to the supermarkets and buy wild food, which is not illegal. We have some uh, Irish organic Irish lamb mm. and straight like out of the water, we have some North Atlantic, or North Atlantic lobsters, which I've got to show you. These, these guys are awesome. So this is going to be our dinner tonight, and I cannot wait. I mean, the food jealousy is serious This right is now. crazy. <laughs> yes. I don't know. You're, you're in one of the best cuisines in the world right now. <laughs> we have been getting some good food, but I want to I recap real quick because a lot of people listening, because we're finding out we're going to these nice dinners with this group of people, and these people aren't up to speed with nutrition. They have no idea about plant toxins, anti-nutrients, oxalates, tannins, lectins, anything we've been talking about, they have no clue. They think that veganism is the way to go. So just to let people know, for all history, cultures have figured out, they're so smart, the intelligence of our ancestors is amazing. They figured out that plants do have these toxins and they find a way to detoxify them. And now we've kind of lost a lot of that knowledge. And I guess I just wanted to say, just in general, if you're listening and this, you're like, what are you talking about oxalates? I thought spinach was amazing. Like, what is an oxalate? Look it up. You, I, I, there's a good vegan site that I go to that has all the dangers of anti-nutrients and it, it warns other vegans about how dangerous <laughs> all these plants can be. But uh, just know that, yeah, plants aren't maybe as magical as we thought. They're, they're fine, but there's a lot more to the story. And if Mary could uh, probably could wrap it up too. Oh, sure. Yes, I think that if we're getting away from traditional diets, we've really got to look, we really have to learn the traditional processing method. So if we're gonna eat an old staple crop, whether it's cassava, corn, potatoes, we have to do some digging and research and learn how to properly properly do it. And luckily enough, Dr. Bill has a school, so you can learn there. There's great books you can dive into, but we can't eat uh, casually if we're eating plants. Yeah, and someone asked about Plant Paradox. I, I don't think that's the best book. It's, it's, it scratches the surface of lectins, and I don't know what you think mm -hmm. about it. He, I think uh, Venturi has a little bit of a cognitive dissonance going on where he says plants are bad but they're also amazing but uh i don't know if you have any good resources for people to find um, out about plant toxins plant toxins i mean i teach courses on plant toxins so you can reach out to me uh there's great videos on youtube elliot overton does great jobs uh on his videos as well and uh it really it's just research mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and bill maybe you can wrap it up and give any resources yep. Actually, can I say something about the book real quick? I know I'd love to talk sure. to you guys in detail about it, but I'm super excited because it's coming out next month. So my book, uh, Eat Like a Human, is coming yes. out on 16th. It's on pre-order now. And again, I'd love to talk more in detail about it, but all of the things we talked about today are in there at some level. And the most important part is that every chapter ends with takeaway things that you can do in your own, own kitchen to feed uh, and nourish your families. So um, it's just one of many inc incredible resources that are out there. And uh, you know, it is always inspiring to talk to both of you. I, I wish we all lived closer together, but I'm glad to at least have, uh, have this to, um, Me to communicate. Me too, we've got to get a trip going sometime. And I, I have a feeling like your book is going to be the ultimate resource. I have been on the edge of my seat waiting for your book to come out. Uh, I think you have no idea oh, how yeah, excited yeah. we all are, so. It's great. Is it eatlikeahuman.com? Uh, eatlikeahuman.com is, is the website, and the book is called Eat Like a Human, and all the major book outlets have it. So in America and a few other countries, it's launching November, and in most of the other countries where it's uh, going to be available, Europe, uh, Ireland, those places, uh, it's going to be uh, available in January. But I'm just talking to these guys. He, he just opened an invitation to come up here. So I think okay. we need to all come here to Ireland, and we can well, feed you some of those lobbies. We'll come. I'm, in, I'm inviting What's Brian. Right? Brian, I'm sorry. That, oh, I will definitely... <laughs> Just, we got to have that. All right, he said we're though. ready. If that we meal's going to be ready for us. Lots of foraging. We'll do lots it's of foraging. It's a hard yes. All right, fantastic. <laughs>
All right, Bill, we're going to get this uh, up so that we can, we'll, we'll have it available for people. Uh, maybe we can even get it to YouTube, but thanks so much. Thank Bill. you so much. Yeah. It's so good to see your face. And thank you for sharing your friends with us as well and your time. Likewise. I look forward to sharing a meal with you in this very cottage one day. All right. Me too. All right, guys. Take care, Bill. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your trip. Thanks. Okay, bye. Bye, Bill.